So here we are, Ducks Don't Get Cold Feet, episode number 27. I am here with George Freeney, and he has done a lot of things, but he's venturing into the world of space. He's kind of like the Adelaide Elon Musk. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, does, that, does that mean I get a doobie? <laughs> well, does that mean I get a doobie if I'm Elon Musk? Surely. Just, just wait. No, it's only early. It's a secret box that we don't talk about. But welcome, George. Thanks for coming. Mate, thanks very much for having me. Really looking forward to having a chat. So I've known George for a long time, and he's probably going to go into detail about how or when, but it was probably pre it was school days. It's actually school days, but you're in the year of I won't give away your age, but it was above me. I was a year older than you, Chad. <laughs> oh, <is it> just <laughs> Only one. one. Right. <laughs> but let's get back into it. I mean, you've done a lot of things, no doubt, George. You are what I would say is the pinnacle entrepreneur, someone that is always trying to start something, someone that could never work for someone <laughs> and someone that, that's had success and failure along the way. Yep, that's very fair. I think that's a good summation. But I have worked for three people in my career. Okay. Three people. One, Yasser Shahin. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've worked for Yasser, which was a great experience. I loved working for Yasser. Jeff Rorschheim from SDM. Yep. And then the first person who ever gave me a job is our current Premier, Stephen Marshall. I used to work for him at Marshall Furniture back I in 2001. Are you serious? Yep. yep. Oh, what a small world. Dead and serious. that actually – so you were selling furniture? I was helping sort of optimise the manufacturing plant and then I was running the commercial furniture division and then I worked with them to sell the business, Marshall Furniture, to Steinhoff back in 2002. Then I worked for Yasser for a while and then I went to Sydney and then I kind of started working for Jeff Rorsheim at SDM. So three pretty well-known people in South Australia, the only three people I've ever worked and I can't imagine working for anyone else. So going to Marshall... Mm -hmm. Like back then, I mean, you're going back a few years. I'm sure. 2001. Yeah. So, you know, you went walking around thinking this guy could be the next Premier of South Australia. Not at all. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, then, as he likes to say, my mum paid him to give me a job because I was a little bit lost back in 2001. And funny story, though, I sat next to him at a conference, a Family Business Australia conference. So, yep. a conference yep. all about family business. Six months later, sat next to him on a plane. On that plane flight, he said, oh, look, George, you should come work for me at Marshall Furniture. I was like, living in Sydney at the time, probably doing more fun than work. Yeah. In fact, doing a lot more fun than work at that point. And I was like, sure, yeah, sounds like fun. So I came back to Adelaide and started working for him. Just like that? Yeah. yeah. Wow. So you- Sliding door moment. Yeah. Slide. So you're originally an Adelaide boy. Yep. So whereabouts did you, you know, were you brought up or- Brought up in, you know, leafy Torrens Park, you know, I promised myself I'd never disclose what school I went to because it's way too Adelaide to talk about what schools you go <laughs> yeah, to. Yeah, okay. But when to one of those schools that I don't really want to talk about. Yeah, um, I went there. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, mate, we didn't, I didn't go there. I went to, I went to a different oh, one. Oh, he did? He went, went, went to a different school than me. Went to a different right. one. Yeah, but okay. sometimes people think I, my dad taught there. Did my dad teach you at PAC? Because my dad taught nearly everyone oh, I went you know, to PAC. They were talking about the principal the other day and – I, I, I struggled to think of one of the teachers. It's a long time ago. A lot's happened since uh, school. A lot has happened since school. And yeah. I, I reckon I was a bit scarred by school. <laughs> like, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I, I went to school and dad, you know, dad left school in Gillis Plains High in year nine. He left with Theo Maris, which, you know, they've done. Really? It. Yeah. They, oh, wow. <laughs> so they both went out and started doing stuff together. They've done pretty well. They've done pretty well, and I, I Dad always said I want to want to send children to an education that he never could. And you know, everyone thinks, oh, you know, you guys have got loaded, but back then, you know, there definitely wasn't. And Dad's put everything into the business, so he he sent me to PAC, and you know, I was always there thinking, you know, what do I got to learn about the weather for, like. <laughs> This geography shit, and <laughs> and now, what are the kids thinking now? Like, uh, do they teach geography uh, and the weather? Oh yeah, there's still geography. Maybe people still have to understand why <laughs> the weather is the way it is on these devices. Maybe, but uh, do you? Yeah. No. No. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so if we go back to where, so where you you brought up, you know, what sort of uh, childhood did you have? Was it? Were, oh, were you look, always a bit adventurous as a as a kid, or was it not? Did as you're told. No, nah, I didn't definitely do it. I didn't do it. Any I was siblings? Told, 
older brother, older sister. So yep. I was the youngest of three. My dad was a teacher, PAC. My mum was a teacher. Oh. My mum's dad was a pretty crazy entrepreneur. My dad's grandfather was a crazy entrepreneur. Like, so he helped found the the Pearling Fleets in Broome. He was the first Australian to have an oil mine. There's a lagoon named after him in Tasmania, Freeney's Lagoon. He was a proper, proper crazy explorer entrepreneur, like early, like late 1800s. So when's that? Late 1800s. Yeah. So yeah, he literally was the first person to have an oil well in Australia. So he was proper entrepreneur, like my dad's grandpa and my mum's dad was a proper entrepreneur. Um, but my parents were really sensible and my brother and sister were really sensible, but I was not sensible in any way, shape or form. I think my parents gave up parenting me at about age 13. So um, it was that young? <laughs> yeah, you know, <laughs> I remember, mate, I was 14. I was like, mum, I'm going to a nightclub. She's like, well, I can't stop you, can you? And I'm like, nope. She's like, just don't come home in a police car. That was it. They were the only instructions. Don't come home in a police car. See, it's changed. <laughs> So, you know, I was pretty, you know, did all right at school though. You know, I was quite studious and academic, but didn't really follow the rules if I didn't think they made sense. And one of my principles is just because it's legal doesn't mean it's right. And just because it's illegal doesn't mean it's wrong. That's that's a great way of putting it. I never heard that. Well, you know, you can do the wrong thing legally and you can do the right thing illegally. So yeah. it's like, you know, you've got to, I always thought you've got to make up your own mind. So I never accept the status quo. I sort of question everything that confronts me. Every time something comes up, I'm like, is that the right way? Could it be better? Should it be done differently? So our, our GM has a philosophy. It's good to get Bob on this podcast, actually. But he has a philosophy of everyone lies. <laughs> yeah. And he is proven right more than wrong. Yeah. Why do you think that is? I don't think it's in human nature. I think we grow up as kids testing the boundaries about how we can get away with what we do and as youngsters, we tell lies and we get away with it. So it becomes an ingrained behavior in how we sort of navigate our way through. And I think sometimes they're very white lies. I think there's yeah. a big distinction between a, a white lie that's really just nothing that's that consequential and a consequential lie, which has big implications attached to it. So we've we've been brought up not quite telling the truth. Mm -hmm. Do you think you could actually go through life without never telling a lie? I think it'd be really hard. I think it'd be really hard. Like I reckon small little white lies emerge yeah. in all sorts of places. Yeah. Well, Jim Carrey found it hard. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, to just say, or was that saying yes to, no, no. Was that saying yes to everything? Yes, man. Yeah. 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 Flying school. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I think there's a, there's a big difference. And in fact, in that the stat, the average stat for lying is, between every 10 minutes of talking, two to three lies, lies right. have taken place. Can I swear on this podcast yeah. for fuck's sake? <laughs> so for fuck's sake, so there is a fact out there. People who swear when they're talking yeah. are more honest. Oh. It's 100% scientifically proven. People who swear are more honest. See, you're listening, Natalie. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's uh, good because I, I try to curb it down. Yeah. But nothing can replace the perfect fuck. <laughs> well, and I think there's contextual use of the language, right? Like here's, you know, you don't want to direct it at someone in a nasty way, but when you use swearing in an expressive way to get a message across, I think it's okay. Yeah, I and there's a, there's a time and a place for it. And I, I think I'll say Gary V, I believe, has made it almost acceptable to say in the right context. Do you love Gary V? Oh, yeah, I do. What are you going to say? Something <laughs> bad? I Not can, at I all. Can, I just, <laughs> I I've got say. no dirt on Gary that would be embarrassing, but I just like, you've got to love this guy. I can tell. Yeah, because I, I think uh, when you actually are probably not afraid to say what you say and that, that unfortunately I see that is the problem with society and the problem that politicians have to go down is that mm. everyone is so careful of, everything they say to, you know, to political correctness gone wrong when, you know, you start changing the past. And I think it's very dangerous to sit and change things that were done in the past. Yeah. And one of the things that I look at that our school back in 19, now this is going back a while, kids, <laughs> um, our, our school, like I think it was 1986, I was looking through some photos the other day and there I was painted black doing an Aboriginal concert. 
And and I look at and and there was someone else dressed as a snowman and like there was all these characters. And I look at that now and I think, damn, you'll never see that. That'll never happen that, again. That that'll never happen again. But back then, no one thought anything of it. And I'm I'm getting frustrated that people are trying to change all these things that actually did happen. You can't look at the past through the lens of the current. You can't go like, this is how we think now yeah. and judge people for what was done 30 years ago Yeah, because it was a different world that you were living in. And I think this is this tendency to do that. It's like, here's how we feel today. Based on that, what was happening then was not okay. And I think that's wrong. Uh, yeah, I, I think it's 100% wrong. Like, you know, that you're getting going to a dress up. I mean, if I go as Michael Jackson, or well, that's a bad one because you don't know if he was black or white. So it's, that's not, not the easiest one to do. But if I... <laughs> If I go as someone that I want to be a character in, that should be up to me. I'm, I'm not going because I, I believe. Like if I dressed as Hitler, it's not. I'm not going because I want to be like him. No, no I'm going because you know I had to go dress up. And needed to start with H. I mean, shit. So this is a, this is interesting territory. I wasn't expecting to get into this zone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I just I think I, I I talk about it a lot because one of the things that's made us different. Is being honest, yep. and but saying things how people wanted to, and giving the finger, having the words to the person buying all the toilet paper in that time, you know, it resonated with so many people. Yeah, it's one of my favourite moments uh, of all of COVID. <laughs> but I remember my friends in. I was sending that uh, that that video of you to my mates in Sydney. It was like it's brilliant, and I think there's a real entrepreneurial honesty about courage in that. Right, you just had the courage to do. What a lot of people wanted you to do, right? Okay. I think a lot of people wanted to see something like that. And it's just being really vulnerable, courageous, honest. And I think that's a lot of what's missing these days. There's a lot of political correctness, trying to do what other people think you should do. I, I, I sort of talk on quite a lot of panels and sometimes you know, I want to make the joke, well, I'm not going to say anything because I'm sure that there's at least one person that can take every single thing I say <laughs> in the wrong way. <laughs> so how do you think that shapes up for how we'll be moving forward as a society because you know no bar bar black sheep like there's no there's none of these things oh, just a second have they banned bar bar black sheep yeah 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 what really yeah no yeah, yeah. bar bar is gone you can't i bet you it's on <laughs> i'm gonna have block. to undo that in my kids mate uh, i've been yeah. singing that to my kids for the yeah. last few years and if you want to buy the book it's on um it's on a tour browser network <laughs> <laughs> silk road <laughs> Um, so buy it with Bitcoin only. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, buy it with Bitcoin. But you know, the, this is I, I see it, and I, I get frustrated. Well, you can't change that because, you know, that's how it was. And by no means am I saying that. But you know, oh, let's not talk about slavery because oh, we don't want to know about that because that's bad. But that's that's what they that's how it was. That's what they did. And as a society, we need to learn from that. Well, you can't erase the past. You can't judge people for what happened in the past in the same way you think today. You've got to accept what happened, learn from it and move on, right? Yeah. But not not cancel everything, you know. Yeah. You just got to accept it, learn from it, move on and be better in the future. And just for the record, it's bar bar rainbow sheep. <laughs> I'm going to change the wording. <laughs> wow, it is too. How scary. So Okay, we got there pretty quick. Let's 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 say uh, you 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 seem to be quite adventurous, young. Yep. And I think I met you. We we're listening to some techno dance music back in the day. Well, so you know, after school, I went to uni. Yeah. I was pretty young. I was only sixteen when I finished school. So I started a chemical engineering degree at age seventeen, and mm -hmm. um, you know, found that all rather boring and you know did you did you finish did yeah you yeah so, i finished because i re i think i recall you going fuck i fucking hate it oh yeah you know so <laughs> discovered 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 techno yeah, <laughs> probably well, in that's... halfway through third year yeah and that's has it to say the last year and a half were a little more challenging to attend uni and get things done <laughs> the, the first two years <laughs> and, <laughs> you know and i think that's when we probably started to see a whole lot more of each other with that crew from uh, from school and yeah you know, that's when I uh, you know, really started to get an interest in dance parties, raves, nightclubs, and, you know, having a whole lot more fun. It was a whole world I'd never even thought about before while I was, you know, younger. Um, and then when I finished uni, I was like, I do not want to be an engineer. I had no interest in working in chemical engineering. Like, I sort of started my chemical engineering degree sort of as a fascist who wanted to mine the world and thought that the indigenous people of our country were just in the way of us mining. Yeah. Then ironic story is that 
one day in third year, I had a I was late to uni as per <laughs> usual, and I uh, had to pick a. a Which is a, unusual because you you are never late now. I never late. Never. Late. I was here one minute early. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's it's uh, that's why I looked at the time and and I was like, he'll be here and. Like V's like, nah, he, and I, he's got one minute. I said, trust me, he'll be here. <laughs> so <laughs> I uh, I got to uni late that day probably because I'd been at a dance party or something and the only topic left for my research project was Eddie Marbo. I had never once considered for one second anything to do with the history of the Indigenous world and I had to do this big project, changed my entire worldview. Like I learned about sort of Terra Nullius and all of the things that were sort of wrong about how the colonists treated the indigenous just changed my worldview. I was like, nah, never want to be an engineer in my life. I'm out. So I finished the course and then I was like, right, just started a spring water company, a t-shirt company, started running dance parties and, you know, started uh, running. Spring water. Spring now water. let's let's talk about your point of difference. Mm -hmm. Now, I think everyone should know you were one of the first people to actually start selling water at a rave party that looked like a hip flask. Correct. <laughs> that was creative. Yes, we thought that was a good idea. It was it was more efficient to pack it in a shelf. Yeah. And you could clip it on your belt with a little clip. <laughs> it was a good idea. Yeah, and you know, that was an unfortunate exercise, right? Like we, we started bottling that product and it, you know, the first bottling run, which you were going to sell in yep. your supermarkets yep. got contaminated. Yep. yep. And, you know, probably been a little young and naive at that point. I thought it would be a good idea when they weren't going to address that problem to take legal action against the company that uh, did it. And that actually ended up in four years of my life fighting litigation against three companies that ended up almost going to the federal court and costing 300 grand plus in legal fees. But then right at the end, we managed to settle. And for four years' work, I reckon I spent 4,000 hours on it. <laughs> we made about 50 grand. <laughs> wow. But but we learned, I learned a lot during that exercise about business, legal stuff, and, you know, probably fighting on principle when you shouldn't fight. But we stood up to the big company and didn't get beaten. Now, I don't think we won, but we didn't get beaten. Well, <laughs> Is that what happened? See, I, I actually knew something happened, but I didn't quite realise that. And what? so you were the first person who was going to give us a shot to get it. So the whole strategy was Drakey puts it in some Drake food market. There wasn't yep. a, a huge nah, number of them back then. This, this was 2000 and <laughs> this would have been 2003. Yeah. And, you know, I was like, right, I've, this is sort of, we're done. We've got it into a supermarket. It's going to sell like hotcakes, prove it up with you, yep. get it distributed everywhere. And then yep. the first production, we could actually never put it on the shelf. Yeah. And that was back in the early 2000s, which there wasn't a million waters for sale. And in fact, back then, petrol was more expensive. Expensive. No, water was more, more expensive. More, 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 yeah, and it is now. God. <laughs> but back then it was one of the few. It was the only yeah. one that looked different. It was the only one that wasn't in a bottle. Yep. And it brings me to the, do you think if you're going to bring out a product now in this day and age, what would you do different about it? If I was going to bring out a spring water product or just any product. Yeah, I think, and not any, because let's be a bit general on it. I mean- Please, no one come and fucking offer me a water. Anyway. <laughs> well, I was actually, that's what I wanted to use this podcast for. I've, I've actually got a new idea that I was going to pitch you for a product. <laughs> uh, but but let's um let let's just say anything. I think there's a valuable lesson there because back in the time, it was unique. You could take it walking. You could buy it at raves. It was more efficient to stack in a fridge. And you could you could you didn't have a bulging thing out of your pocket. It wasn't like a porn star reunion. It was it clipped on neatly onto the belt, and it was different. And after seeing that, I said, "Yeah, we'll take it." And I was, you know, I remember having to break people's balls at Drake's because it was such a big problem. And then you had dramas with it. But what would you, what it you know what would you say you would do now? in any product and we'll get into what product you're peddling soon but not as elaborate as what you're peddling right now just, <laughs> just for the record i think well let's just like if i was yep. bringing out a product right like a that i wanted to sell on supermarkets like a food or like a consumable product yep. you got to yeah. have a point of difference and you got to believe in that point of difference right because if as the entrepreneur you don't have a deep passion 
for what it is that you're doing and a belief in the product. You'll never push through the inevitable barriers that exist. Yep. And it's got to tap into a trend, right? So going back to Jumu Tonic, yep. which I love, by the way, I'm feeling amazing at the moment. <laughs> like it's it's got a point of different. Dirty Clean Eats, it's got a clever name. It's sort of like, yeah, it's clean, but it's dirty, tastes good, but it's healthy. Yep. Um, and it's really healthy. It's good for you. It plugs into the trend of wellness and health that you're seeing emerge, you know, in the young and the older now. So I think, you know, tap into a trend Yep. And you got to be deeply passionate about it and you got to have a real point of difference, whether it's a brand point of difference or an underlying product characteristic point of difference. Well, that is exactly what happened to the boys. And yep. that's, is that actually them? It is actually them as the characters on it. But that's exactly what they are. Mm. Deep, entrenched interest because of trying the product yep. was good for them. And now they come back and peddle it here. Yeah. And I think what's funny, we we're talking about belief earlier on today and you have to believe in it. And if you actually trying to sell something you don't believe in, it comes a, somehow the psyche there, something in the universe, and you might have some interpretation of it, it, it figures it out. And people know. And is it disingenuine or disingenuous, right? Yeah. Yeah. You know, so, people feel like you're lying. Like I think if you're trying to sell something you don't believe in. You get that sort of snake oil salesman sort of yeah. feeling in the other person, right? If you're not authentic and vulnerable and able to explain why what you're doing makes sense to you and is good, it's just not going to work. And I think that's whether it's a, a new health tonic. Yeah. I love this one. Jumu, 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 how do you pronounce it? Jumu tonic, yeah. my favorite. Yeah. Um, I think that it's a truism. No matter what sort of product or service you're in, those characteristics come through. So when you're talking about products like a fast-moving consumer ball, I know you're about your water. What did you go into after that? So we had the water business. That consumed a lot of time. So while I was pursuing the legal activities on that is when I started working for uh, Yasa yep. at, um, uh, on the run at Peregrine Corp. And so I you know, was on the salary there. And then when I finished there, I moved to Sydney and started working in um, management consulting. Um, and then I met these crazy Danish guys uh, yeah. In 2006, we had this idea for a travel technology business. This is pre-iPhone, right? Pre-smartphone. Yeah. And their travel their travel technology was going to help big companies and travel agents track travelers around the world based on their itinerary data. They suck in data and then you can manage how you're See, tracking See, that sounds job. good. I thought it was a great idea. So I gave them some money, started working with them, had a job at the same time. That started to work. 2008, I stopped working and just focused on that and that started to grow quite nicely. And that was sort of my first real taste at technology entrepreneurship. I mean, I was a small investor. I was running the Asian business. The two Danish guys owned most of it. We had some external investors and VC. So that's how I learned about external investors, technology, VC, business to business, you know, software sales. And it was super good fun. I, I really loved it. We started to sell that business in 2011. And due to some structural issues with how we had shareholders, it was yep. a really difficult process and we sold it for far less than what we should have. And we made some money, you know, we sold it to Conquer and then SAP bought it. We made some good money out of that. But it wasn't, you know, go home money. It wasn't, it was just a taste of, you know, getting something working really well. Um, great experience. I loved it. I had so much fun doing that. And then towards the end of that, I had this crazy idea to um, to build a technology platform to help people find physical retail stores. So the whole, the beginning premise of that was I wanted to get an alert when I was near a physical shop that sold the product I wanted. So this is, uh, this is Boodle. Boodle. But it yep. wasn't called. It was called Caboodle to begin with. That's right. Yep. And I remember because you went to Sydney and I was, I, I was, you know, this, the, the business, it went to Sydney and that's when you started seeing around you had something to do with. Yeah. Um, other people. And I, I was like, okay, so this traveler itinerary, you know, valuable lesson if someone's listening. What what did you have set up wrong that made that a non a, a less saleable item? Right, so when you had to when the push come to so I mean a lot of people might not understand that you get something wrong in some paperwork and it can cost you. Yep. So so there's a few things that went wrong in that. So when when the founders, the Danish guys, bought in external investment they enabled the terms of the agreement to be very favorable to those investors, more so than it should be. So when, as you needed to raise, and inevitably you need to raise more money and things don't go to plan, every time more money was needed, they sort of just ratcheted more control yeah, away from the founders across to the, to the investors. 
and that never really works right. Sophisticated investors understand that you need to empower the founders to do what's needed in an unconstrained way with capital to grow the business. Unsophisticated investors go, well, I don't trust that founder. I need to make sure I've got some control so I can keep them under, you know, keep them on the leash. Yeah. It doesn't work. It's just the, the, the data supports back the founder, let them run. When the company gets really big, then you start to mature it. So they got that structure wrong from the beginning. So it was a really good lesson in understanding how to ensure you get the right relationship between you as the founders and the investors that enables the flexibility to move forward. So when it came to selling the company, though the alignment of the investors' interests was very different to the alignment of the founders' interests. Yep. And so then the sort of the investors got far better looked after than the founders. And then those two groups were arguing with each other. So the buyer sort of exploited that because they could see it and therefore was able to get away with paying a lot less than you normally would have. I reckon they've got 75% lower price than they should have. Wow. Yeah. So that was a really good lesson in sort of the corporate governance and structure layer of how one of these businesses worked. I'd never thought about it until that point. I'd just been product, 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 fine, you know, sell stuff, get it working with the customer. It's amazing to think that we go back to 2007, is it? 2007, 2013. Here you are talking about technology that is sucking the the itineraries <laughs> in, like how, how the world's changed in such a quick a short period of time. Like, what's Conte? What are they doing? Like, do you know what they're doing now? Con so Contigo was sold to Concur. Concur was sold to SAP. So okay. the underlying technology, they still use the technology yeah. as part of SAP's travel and risk management solution. So it's still there. It exists. And they still use itinerary data for that purpose because there's two, you know, two useful data sources, where my itinerary says I should be yeah. and where my phone says I am. Yeah. And that's both both of those sets of data are useful in how you manage corporate travel programs. So these days a lot more sophisticated way of yep. putting that together. But back back then, if you talk about raising or, you know, value valuations, what what's how many so you came on what what stage? I invested what I would describe as a seed stage into that business. Yep, and so then straight did, off the bat. Yeah, early, early stage. I was some of the probably first capital into that. And it wasn't yep. a large amount of yep. money. It was like 50 grand. Yep. Campbell put something with me. Yeah. Excuse me. Um, so that was a, a really good experience from an investor and being an entrepreneur's lens. So with that, how did you come across these guys? Oh, man, how did I? So I met them through the consulting business I was engaged in. So I just like literally met this guy, Johnny Torson, Danish guy. I'd never met a Danish person before. Very and crazy. we started we started talking about what we're doing. I was like, man, this guy's amazing. Like I was literally like, oh my God, this guy's incredible. Like I need to do something with this dude. Yeah. And you know, literally it was just the relationship built. He's still a great friend. I was chatting with him on WhatsApp this afternoon. So those two, the investors, then, you, no, so they were their founders. Yep. And uh, then you've come on. How many other investors? I'm just trying oh, to. There's probably like seven or eight other investors. Yep. You know, okay, so a travel big. agency. No, not not a huge number. Yeah. Uh, and then you go for your your funding, then more investors come. So yep. what, if people don't understand it, that you get keep on getting seed investment you go early. Pre-seed. I, I said this is the stage. <laughs> pre-seed. Yeah. Friends and family, really yep. early stage, no product, sort of just the first bit of money to get with the seed. Yep. You've got a more established business idea. You might have a prototype, an early customer commitment. So it's then series A, I've got customers, I've got some revenue, I've got things working. Yep. Series B, starting to really grow this business now. The money, the capital's there and to grow. And then you know, some businesses go series C, D, E, F, and keep on, on the going market. to yep. what they need. Yep. Uh, and then that gets you to a saleable situation if, it, you know, I, I, I just want to go down this track because investing in ideas or people, you know, that's, I'm going to ask you a question in a minute, so get ready for it. Investing in ideas, people or a, or a business, it's not easy. No. And you get one that may work out of, I don't know, 20, maybe more, and you all hope to get that. Facebook or, you know, something <laughs> Google or, you know, something ridiculous. Let's face it. That's what you're really hoping. Well, if you're investing early in tech, Correct. you are hoping for like a hundred bagger. <laughs> <laughs> Or is that no? It's a unicorn. A hundred, <laughs> you know, but it, you know, a hundred bagger is a hundred times your money. So you know, to get a hundred bagger, it sort of needs to become a unicorn. And you know, if I put a ten thousand dollars in and get a hundred, I get a million dollars. <laughs> so that sort of terminology, I, I I think it's why. And some people, you only hear about the success too. Yeah, and um, that's why I think it's interesting that. It's like gambling. You only hear when people are winning, funny enough. Hey, JB, I, <laughs> mate, I put some out of the horse today and I lost it. It wasn't. 
<laughs> There's no one wants to talk no, about the loss, not. right? Yeah. And you go to the casino, you tell all your mates, yeah, look at this and why, and then when you don't win, you'd not ring them, yeah. <laughs> yep, lost a thousand bucks. No, no yeah. one takes a photo of the yeah. pokey screen <laughs> when, it, when it's got like, you've just lost all your money. It's only when they go, do 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 yeah. You sit there and you don't do it because we yeah. we naturally talk about things that are positive for a start and you, you know, it makes you sound like a fucking loser. I mean, let's face it, the best thing they did was you can only withdraw a thousand bucks. Saved me a few times. <laughs> it saved me a million times. <laughs> because I'm like, okay, I'm happy for that to be my entertainment. Yeah. Like, if that's what I want to do, like, it's probably cheaper than some of the other things that I've so, done. I think there's a good point there. If you're investing in really early stage ideas, yep. like if you're investing before it's a business, if yep. you're investing in a business, it's like it's up, it's running, it's got revenues, you can sort of extrapolate and understand what your money will do to help it grow. That's that's business investing, private equity, that's a very different equation. If you're investing early, you are either doing one of a few things. You're gambling, right? Or if you are properly investing, you have a portfolio approach and you do it continuously because you understand that one in 20 might work, one in 100 might become amazing. And if you're not doing it systematically and thematically, it is just gambling or philanthropy. You're donating money to people. <laughs> uh, George, uh, don't get me started. But th it's true and a lot of people, for me, is it more important to back the, the, uh, the horse? It's more important about the person. If it, yep. the, the earlier stage it is, the more important it is, the person is more important. Right? Like the people become less important as the business is larger. Like right in the like the likelihood that the first idea is the one that ends up being the one that makes lots of money is pretty low. Uh, and I think I've invested in things that I've seen those people fail in the past. And sounds bad, but it sort of gives you a bit of a realisation of I think you need to go down that track because to be very lucky to get things right every time, I, I almost think it's non-existent. So, I, and I think there's two things I'd say about it. One is, you know, in America the culture is really different. You know, people accept failure sort of as a – failure is a badge of honour, whereas, you know, here it's sort of viewed as poor and I think it's wrong. Like, you know, failure is a really good thing. And I think, you know, I think I learned a lot out of Contigo – like yeah. some really valuable lessons, but I learned a lot more out of Boodle. And other than for what I learned, you know, from an investor's perspective, Boodle was a failure, right? Yeah. We raised over $10 million and we had to liquidate the company. Now, that fills me with pain. Like I reckon, it's, I reckon it took me two and a half years to get over that because I care so deeply about, you know, getting it right. But it was a really complex problem. And, you know, so I, I learned far more out of that than I did out of the one that succeeded. And I reckon as a result of the two of them, I have a much more resolved view on how to pursue these ideas. Because now. Boodle's good, let's talk about it. Because um, naturally when you're going to do an idea, it's friends and family first. And just obviously every, I think everyone does it, right? And so there are a few of friends involved with Boodle and you – you're seeing that journey take place where you get to a stage or oh, hang on, this idea is not quite working. We need to change tact. And I know what you originally showed me in maybe it was Caboodle. Yep. To then what I saw in Boodle, they were different things. Completely. And every one of your ideas has come just on the cusp of the technology changing or catching. Mm. Is that, is that yeah, fair? Yeah. Yeah, like we probably change, like pivot, you know, in the startup world, they call it pivot or persevere. You know, you're pivoting all the time, trying to find a fit. But, you know, it's a really interesting journey, right? Like you raise money from people you know because they're the ones that trust you to do the right thing with it. You do your best to go and find out how it works. And, like, I still remember, like, we raised money from friends and family and we used that to go and then resolve a pitch to go and get money from professional investors. Yeah. We thought we were the smartest people in the world when we got $2.8 million from, like, James Packer and the head of UBS. Like, I was like, oh, my God, we're the smartest people on the planet, yes! <laughs> and I was like, we was just so far off. Like, when I look back at that and I look at me then, I'm like, oh, God, I'm cringe, cr <laughs> cringe at the lack of uh, awareness about what was going on. But we were giving it our best shot and I think – I have this very sort of strong principle now. When you ask somebody to back you on something risky, it doesn't have to be like, if you're doing something risky and you're asking someone for support, the only thing you can promise them is that you'll leave nothing on the field of endeavor in the pursuit of that outcome. I can't promise I'll give you a return on your investment or what we're doing works, but you can promise you'll give it everything 
in the best way possible to make it work. And I think that's the principle of early stage in, oh, not my, that's the principle uh, in early stage investing is that you can only promise that. So I think, you know, my learning on Boodle is I think we did that well. Like we promised that and we executed as hard as we could and we kept going until the point where we decided it was no longer it was no longer appropriate to take small sums of money. Yeah. The only way to launch that business was a very big check. And when it became clear we couldn't get that very big check, the only decision that you could make as a board was to liquidate the business. So can you talk us through that? When when you started to see the writing on the wall, is that, yeah. I don't know if that's a fucking nice way to say it. But, <laughs> no, 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 it's a sensible. But, but when did you actually start to think? Hang on, because uh, I'm assuming there's a lot of ego. There's a lot of like I've been building this for however many years. Yeah, there's there's uh, a lot of time. Yeah. There's a lot of money. There's a lot of sense of self tied up in what you're doing. So and it's like your identity is attached to it. Yeah, and other people's money. And other people's money. So I think it becomes harder and harder. Like, there's a term they use for it. It's like the commitment curse or the commitment paradox. Like you're escalating commitment paradox, right? The more I commit, more effort I put into it, the harder it is to make the right decision because you're so deeply committed. But I think, you know, having an external board, sensible, pragmatic investors on the board, you're always sort of checking yourself going, are we drinking the Kool-Aid yep. and believing in what we're seeing or are we looking at the numbers for what they really are and making a pragmatic decision? Yep. So, you know, we decided as a board that we needed to raise at least $10 million but preferably a pathway to $50 million to be able to drive this business. And I remember I was at a conference with a, a VC called Joe Schoendorf who was one of the founders of Axel and I was explaining Boodle to him at this conference. I think it was 2016. He's like, look, George, you know, that's really smart, really good thesis. But, He's American, I'm yeah, guessing. Yeah, yeah, but okay. yeah I'll do a bad American <laughs> accent. <laughs> I, I, I was just picking up. <laughs> Is it wrong to do an American Yo, accent? George, Am I allowed to no, do an American you, accent? No, of course. Yo, George. <laughs> well, George. Yeah, sorry. But he said to me, he's like, you're going against the trend. Makes perfect sense. It's logical, but you're going against the trend. If you go against the trend, the only way to go against the trend is you need lots of capital. So it's like from a, an investor's thesis, like, go against the trend, where's all your capital coming yep. from? So we set the target of trying to find $50 million in capital, and we found some investors in the Middle East um, who committed 10, but also wanted to go further with us. So we thought, we've got a term sheet done. We thought we'd done the deal. One of my investors flew in, we drank champagne, shook hands. Like, so I'm, like, this is I'm like, yeah, mate, we've got the money we need. We've got runway. Yeah, yeah, yeah we've got runway. We can go against the trend. Um, and so we thought it was done, and literally that deal just disappeared. Like, I flew back to Australia, right, team, we're good. We're going to start in my head, we're starting to gear up. And then it became very clear that this just wasn't going to happen. I, and I couldn't understand it because – in Australia, like Easy. sign a term sheet, that means it's going to happen. Or shake hands. Yeah. Like. So, you know, that was a really, you know, once we understood that that deal wasn't going to happen and we couldn't get another one to replace it, there was money on the table, like small amounts, not large yeah. amounts. And we viewed that it was not ethical to take a small amount of money because that would not solve the problem. So yeah. it was at that point that we were like, fine, you know. It was, and it was hard, right, because we'd been growing revenue, growing users, like the traction was actually looking reasonably positive. So with our, oh, don't get me started on signing a deal, like actually celebrating a deal and it not happening, like. Yeah. Well, we thought it'd be done. We were just having a glass of champagne on the back of a term sheet being signed. It was, it was very disappointing. Yeah. So what transpired between you coming back to, to Sydney, like, yeah, I got a deal. What period of time do people look into, what the fuck just, George, where's, where's this money? So we came back, you know, we started to try and work through getting paperwork in place to support yep. that deal. And the people, were the counterparties in Dubai over in um, the Middle East just said, no, nah, this isn't, you know, and we're not going to do it anymore. And they stopped talking to us. Okay. I was like, that's very odd. Yeah. So it was a very disappointing experience from our perspective. Yeah. And I, to clarify, your, I'm a like your, the board you had for boot, or like your, you would have been very well set up to yes. be able to do exactly that. So yep. I'm, I'm assuming it wasn't because of you that was holding it up. No, no, no. We had a pretty professional board. So yeah, you did. <laughs> it was a pretty extensive board too. Like there were lots, would have been lots learnt from that board. As I said, like in hindsight, that lesson was incredible. And you know, ostensibly, all of the people who invested are people I still have good positive relationships with. So I think, you know, despite the fact that we didn't succeed in getting the investment returns, people were happy with the fact how we'd gone about executing. And I think for when I'm talking to young entrepreneurs about, 
you know, investing in their early stages, like be so careful about how you structure your deals early because a, a bad deal early can unstick you. And the other one is like, if you do things right, if you are a good actor and you're honest and you're transparent with what's happening and you treat people with respect and you do the right thing, then doesn't, you know, in the end, a good investor will understand it's investing, you know, things don't work. So it gets us to, I think that was 2018. 2017 was when we finalised the liquidation of that. I was in Sydney, so my wife and I had three young kids. We decided to move back to Adelaide. So interestingly enough, coming back to Adelaide, now I'm just guessing you sold a house in Sydney and came back to Adelaide, you would have been thinking you were like, President, <laughs> I was, I actually nothing came to mind. So I was going to say, I was going to say Marcel, Marcel, but then I realised that was a <laughs> can't say that anymore. Yeah. Uh, oh, okay. No, oh, yeah. Funny. Yeah. Sorry. Um, so then you come back to Adelaide, which which is great because you're one of these that had to leave Adelaide because I can't I can't try and be in. Well, this is what it was back then. I think it's a bit different now. I might add. It is different. Yeah. But you were like, Fuck, guys, I, we got to go to Sydney. I can't do what I got to do here in Adelaide. So you're one of the ones that coming back, you know, coming back to Adelaide and I'm a little bit biased, definitely the best place to definitely bring up family. Maybe if you're a party animal, maybe not, but I'm sure <laughs> if, if, I, if I had to party again, I'm sure I'd find where the right places would be. <laughs> it's don't ask Ollie. Um, so, so, then, then, so then you've come back here, which I reckon would have been pretty tough to, to originally come back. Um, because of what's happened, and you would have taken a hit. Yeah, but- I, I thought it, it was. You know, we decided to come back not because we stopped doing Boodle. You know, we wanted to come back because the family. Like we had three young kids. You know, not a lot of family. We had no family in Sydney. It was yeah. a pretty difficult environment to have three young kids. I've got a nine-year-old, a seven-year-old, and a five, almost five-year-old. Um, so it was, you know, multiple reasons for coming back here. We wanted a different lifestyle for the kids and easier life. But coming back here, it was a little bit like. It was a bit confronting. My identity had been wrapped up in pursuing a crazy big idea as a startup founder yeah. for quite some time. And, yeah, it was hard. Um, you know, it was very different to what we'd been doing. Because did you have your mind on what you wanted to do coming back to Adelaide? Not really. Yeah, I, I didn't think you did because I, I remember I, I reached out to you and said, yo, well, it's, you know, you're back in town. And, you know, it took forever to finally catch up, but it seems to be like that with everyone. Hey, let's catch up. Let's catch up. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm busy. Uh, kids, kids, yeah. kids. <laughs> Correct. Every minute of your waking life that's not at work is that. Um, and so then you've been settled in for a while and you come across an idea, which I believe you might, you've probably changed already, um, but about sending things into space and your new business. So yeah, that you so set up. Space Machines Company is a is an idea. Yeah, hang on, what? it's a fucking cool name. Yeah, thanks, mate. We like it. In fact, hey, hey, inspiration. Elon Musk's The Boring Company was the inspiration for the Space Machine Company. Can we have that doobie now? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Look out! <laughs> no, no. So you know, I, I came back and I didn't really have a plan other than I was doing advisory work and I was um, fortunate to be invited to join the board of the RAA, which was really surprising to me. Part of my head was like, George, you're a failure. You couldn't make this thing work. And then the other part of me is like, well, these people really seem to like the way I think about things. Yeah. This was like this, I was sort of down on myself in how I thought, but other people seemed to quite like the way I thought. And a lot of people sort of said, that experience you've got is quite unique and interesting. We'd quite like to talk to you about that. So I, I was fortunate to join the RAA board, which was a great opportunity um, to sort of see how a large organisation runs from a governance perspective. I was invited to join the Flinders Uni Governing Council, so I joined that and again, a really interesting different perspective and I was um, really privileged to be asked to sit on the government's entrepreneurship advisory board, um, which was the sort of formation of the office of the chief entrepreneur, the appointment of the chief entrepreneur role in Lot 14. And so I was on there until October of last year with a front row seat at sort of the strategy of the state. So as part of that, you know, during that time, I really observed a couple of things. One, innovation inside large organisations and then what's going on in the state and, you know, a big theme inside that was space. So, you know, I started working on a couple of projects. I've got two main projects now. One is an innovation advisory called 11.2. Um, and 11.2 stands for 11.2 kilometres per second, which is the 
velocity required to put something into outer space or get outside the gravitational pull of the Earth. That's pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, man. <laughs> and look, the, the backstory <laughs> on that is that the, the whole experience with Boodle sort of was it was a good idea without enough fuel to get it into, into orbit. So the 11.2 name sort of touches on the experience we had with, with Boodle. And then whilst my partner, Rajat Kolkhtresta, who's one of the smartest people I've ever worked with, whilst we're working on 11.2, an idea came up, which the first incarnation of was to build an autonomous in-space manufacturing capability. And so what I mean by that is, you know, we, we had a vision that in the future, you should be able to sit down at a laptop, configure a payload for a satellite, press a button, and a factory in space autonomously manufactures that satellite and ejects it into the correct orbit. And I was like, well, that's a great idea. Let's do that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, shit, man, that sounds really cool. So, you know, 11.2, our advisory business is in the business of incubating or, you know, validating ideas. So we started working on that idea and talking to people. So just to yep. fill that in a bit, so it prints it 3D. It prints it 3D in space. That was the <laughs> original idea. Are you allowed to say what you were printing? Yeah, just circuit boards and like the equipment. So to make a satellite on Earth, right, you have to put a whole lot of sort of capability into it and strength and reinforcing to deal with being launched. Yeah. So if you actually made the same satellite capability in space, it would actually be much simpler, Yeah. right? But you have to get the capability in space to manufacture it. So, I, you know... Promise me. So like a shipping container? Yeah, something like that. And it's got a whole autonomous equipment inside it that manufactures the satellite. 30 or 40 years from now, that will be happening. That will just be normal, you know. Like like on, you know, Amazon, web <laughs> services created computing infrastructure. You know, you don't need to go and buy computer boxes anymore. This is this will happen in space. I promise you, 30 years from now, there will be autonomous manufacturing I can't wait to go back and listen to these. <laughs> I, I'm looking forward to those time because... Who the fuck would have thought that, oh, yeah, put stuff in the cloud and yep. pay a lot of fucking money? Great idea. Who would have, if you was peddling that, I'd go, George, come on, mate. I think you've got to be a bit more creative. <laughs> like, So anyway. that that idea started to get shaped over time. You know, 11.2 validates ideas. We started validating it and we came, we came up, we got to the point of what's called an orbital transfer vehicle. I like to call it a space career van. So, so an... OTV. Yeah, an OTV. So if you think about getting things to the right places in space. Yeah, right? so okay. Like so right, that's a good – that's a good – Right on Explain Earth, that. Yeah, so on Earth, right, if you want to get a parcel that's got no power of its own, it's like a box full of wine to someone's house, it might go on a truck, a train, a plane, a boat, and then it's going to end up in a van, and that van is going to take it the last mile – to your house. Yep. Similar infrastructure is going to be required in space. So as we start to do a far, far more stuff in space, big rockets like Elon Musk's spaceships yep. are going to go up to low Earth orbit and then little space courier vans are going to come out of those rockets with a whole lot of small satellites in them and fly around and put those satellites into the precise orbits they need to be. Yep. And that is a massive growing market. So we honed in on the idea of we want to build a space courier van or an orbital transfer vehicle. So Space Machines Company is building a space courier van um, here in Australia. We started manufacturing the first one um, with the objective of launching the first one in 2022. And by 2024, sort of providing commercial capability to go and put satellites in the correct orbits. So we've been lucky enough to have Flavia on here. She's so cool. And to, and to listen to her talk about, like, the most expensive thing about getting stuff to space is the launch. Yep. Once you actually have a, have whatever the payload is, so is that the right one? Correct. Once the payload is... How far out of the, not atmosphere, how many kilometres from the ground is that sort of? Look, mate, I am not 70, the technology okay. yeah, engineer, but I think it's 600 to 700 kilometres for low Earth orbit, but I'm sure some very much smarter aerospace engineer is going to say I'm wrong. But, you know, Flavia is an incredible entrepreneur and her business model requires somewhere between 100 and 150 what's called nano satellites, yeah. a satellite about the size of a shoebox, to be orbiting the planet. L at lower? At low Earth orbit. Low Earth. And low Earth orbit means they spin around really quickly. And then you've got geostationary orbit, which is much higher, but the satellite stays over the same point on Earth all the time. So the little ones are spinning around really fast. So what people don't understand is that those satellites, those little ones, they only stay up there for two to three years. They Their orbit decays and then they enter the atmosphere and burn up. So if your business model requires 100 satellites to be orbiting, yeah. you have to replace 50 a year. 
Right. So therefore, there's this massive growing market. So I'm guessing a satellite's expensive. Oh, a couple hundred grand. Yeah. And getting cheaper. You know, the launch is far more expensive. And it, an interesting <sighs> thing that's happening is because of what Elon's doing with his big rockets, the cost of getting one kilo into space is going down rapidly. Yeah. So it's getting much, much cheaper. So do you want to talk about that space? Oh. <laughs> I've been waiting to the use space that. space. <laughs> <laughs> so, Jeez, I can't believe it took so long. So, so it's you know when you look at the how things have evolved. Like, like someone was talking about to get an astronaut into space, NASA controlled the whole process. So even the Russians were paying. Uh, it was a hundred million per. As it was something. It's a redonkulous number. I don't yeah. know if you know it, but no, but the US has been paying the Russians because the US haven't been up there for a long time. Now they are. And now Elon's come through and he's he's sitting there going, okay, well, let's just keep trying to shoot things up. I mean, the booster rocket's landing. That's quite remarkable to, to actually watch. Mm. It's actually incredible to reuse. So that's bringing the cost of getting, is it out of the atmosphere, down dramatically. Yep. Yep. And now we're in a situation where you've got Bezos. It seems like if you've got a, a lot of fucking money, you should have some rockets. So how do you, what's happened with you, George? <laughs> well, you know, we've come at that from a different <laughs> angle. Like we've got no real uh, capital for doing that, which is far more fun. It's much more fun doing these things on the smell of a lot of rags. So, so they, so they, Bezos is, you know, going up, he's you know, made a comment that he's going to go a month before Elon. Like I reckon once you start rushing going up to space, I think it's pretty bad. Bad things happen. <laughs> well, yeah, I think you, I'd, and hence why you go back to Challenger and all the competing to get. You know, they were sending school teachers into space as, as part of. Look, anyone can go, and mm. you know that didn't turn out too well for the Challenger. And um, when you look at what's happening now, are you? Say, I, I'm feeling like there's a bit of a resurgence to space. Yeah, let's go to space. And what's your thoughts on that? I think that the promise of the 1960s, like, you know, the late 60s yep. when we first put man on the moon is starting to be realised and the the fact that there will be bases on the moon. So, you know, Russia and China have, you know, announced that they're collaborating on putting a base on the moon and the Americans, you know, have planned to have people on the moon in 2024 and base by late in a decade just means that space is happening, right? Like once you've got people actually located on the moon, living on the moon, and if you want to, you know, get a hypothetical for that, there's a great show on um, a, a, what is it, Apple TV called For All Mankind, yeah. just like a hypothetical about people living on the moon. But once that happens, you've got a lunar economy, right? You've got infrastructure that has to be in place. Um, and therefore, just the proliferation of the things going on in space will grow. It's sort of like the first step in colonization. So then people will start to put more staging posts between Earth and the moon. And you, there's talk of having a space hotel by 2027 where there'll be 120 rooms where people can go up there and stay. And so, you know, the, like with airlines, you know, aircraft were really dangerous <clears throat> in the early days. Yeah. We will start to work through perfecting this. And, you know, 20, 30 years from now, it will all look completely different like what happened from 1900 to the 1930s with aircraft. So do you think it'll still be called air crash disaster? <laughs> Spacecraft disaster. <laughs> so I, I, you look at it, you, what is the actual rule that if, let's say you and I go, fuck it, we're going, where, where do we want to go to the moon? Or, well, I don't know why, but let's say we go there, land and start setting up. Who, who owns that? Like, it's a bit of an unknown concept at the moment, right? Like there's treaties that are in place that not all parties are signed up to and it's a it's a question mark. So, you know, you'd probably argue that the race is on to get to the moon to stake out territory. Like I was there first. <laughs> That's probably the greatest argument you can have. Like the treaty, like the UN does this and there's some very eminent Australians that are on the UN sort of lunar treaty committees and others to try and work out what space law looks like. So the treaties that were entered into back in the 60s are starting to become a little... You know, dated and irrelevant. But you know, my my view is that there's just a space race to get to the moon and be able to ensure that you have presence. So if I rocked up, ripped up, took out that American flag, which might not even be there, and <laughs> that's a whole other issue, <laughs> and then planted the JP flag. Yeah. Um, this is mine. Can anyone dispute that? I guess I'd get uh, invaded. I think that you know. I think the view is that. Rip the American like one up. You know, you need to just land in a different spot over there like Antarctica. That's now not, that's my spot on the moon. <laughs> it's cr it's hard. It, I actually, I thought about it because I, yeah, I'm, I'm, I like space and like I mean, I'm into 
you know, that forefront and going to different planets and, you know, let's just face it, I don't think we're the only people here. And Oh, this is a big development on uh, Look, we have gone from space machines, but we I want to bring it back to space machines before we start going there. So you you developed a product and you call it pivoting. And because I originally saw um, you guys are going to print stuff in space and then if I wanted a satellite or something, I'd let it out. And, you know, you could say, hey, I want them to, you know, for uh, self-driving cars or, you know, make sure my irrigation on the farms. Like there's so many things that are the internet of things that people just forget that the technology is coming backwards and forwards from things circling the planet. Mm. Then you've changed your, your model a bit to what's going on there? So just the, the first step in that, journey is you have to have a spacecraft that's capable of changing its position in orbit so you know and there is a market for that so our first first step on the journey is to build our orbital transfer vehicle that we use as a like a courier van a service to put unpowered satellites into the correct orbits um, so that that is all that is designed it started to be manufactured you know we expect to launch a scaled down version of it in sort of the first half of next year it's, um, so Adelaide I believe have just approved a launch site. Launch site. Yeah, the Southern Launch launch site at Whalers Way over near Port Lincoln has been approved. So that will, you know, hopefully start to see launches going from there, like by the end of this year. So if that's that's they're looking to start that as, and is that a good position? Like I'm assuming, well, well, there's nothing more to the the south. Well, but. so it's. Yes, it is a good spot to launch stuff for some orbits. So if you okay. want to get, if you want to, you want to orbit what's called a polar orbit, it's where the satellite's going around the pole. It's a great spot to launch from. If you want to go to the moon, it's not a great spot to launch from, yep. apparently. But there's a bit of conjecture around that, you know. Yeah. But the, the simple physics of it are: the further south you go, it makes it harder to get into an equatorial orbit, which is something spinning around the equator. The further south you go, or north, the easier it is to get into a polar orbit. Yeah. That's and that's about the limit of my orbital knowledge because that is a very deep science. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, there's a lot more smarter people working that out. There are a lot more than me, but like, I am not an aerospace engineer. I caveat everything I've said with the fact <laughs> I am not an aerospace engineer. <laughs> so it's no coincidence that you've been involved with the, I think, the rebuilding of SA um, in a roundabout way. Um, been on in the innovation committee. You've got to work with some pretty amazing people. During that, I think who was the in charge of that? Was that the first chief entrepreneur was yeah. Jim Wally? Yeah, the uh, the Air Force test pilot. Yeah. You know, he did he's, a fantastic job. He's great to talk to. Yeah, very um, interesting. Now the the next chief on or the current chief entrepreneur is a guy called Andrew Nunn, who you know very successful businessman has a business called JBS and G, and he's an environmental engineer and I think doing a, a fantastic job. But uh, I've been very fortunate to be able to see the strategy for the state becoming, you know, more economically complex and creating a future economy and transitioning us away from sort of the past economies we relied on, which is an incredibly important exercise if we want to be a flourishing, thriving, growing state and city in the future. And, you know, I think most importantly, you know, enable, I, I think the metric for success is the young, our kids yeah. will choose to go away knowing they can come back and do meaningful jobs yeah. versus when I think we were young, I was like, well, to actually go and do something really interesting, I have to go away. Yeah. You know, you know, so I think South Australia now is a very different place. I think what's happened, what's happening at Lot 14 and at Tonsley and out at Mawson Lakes and the innovation sort of strategy that we've got around space, cyber, machine learning, artificial intelligence, ag tech, um, so, you know, I think it's incredible. You know, you've, you've had Mohan Koo. Oh, am I allowed to use that no, name? No, you're not. Censored. Censored. you had... <laughs> <laughs> you know, you had someone on here who was talking cybersecurity. Like he was a visionary. You know, I think he was way ahead of his time. You've had Flavia on here talking about space, and I think being able to see all of that. You know, one of the reasons I had confidence to be involved in a space project was because I had seen the direction of the strategy that the state was taking. And you know, there are now hundreds of people working in space on Lot 14. So, you haven't mentioned defence. You don't believe in war. Well, no, I think that, um, that war is a sort of truism of humankind. Um, I think that defence is an important construct in the space world, right? A lot of what has happened in space was driven by 
uh, defence requirements, um, and I think that will continue. Because I had an, <clears throat> I had an interesting. Oh, I was sitting next to someone, and I actually can't say what they were doing, but they knew a bit about submarines, and the comment was made that you'd be surprised at how many Russian subs come to our doorstep. Being up, it was, we're talking northern Australia. Mm. You'd be surprised at how many. Yeah, it did say Russian. <laughs> Um, well, fuck, if they're listening to me, if they're listening to me about their cyber security, there's a problem. So so they they came in and basically he, he was saying you'd, you'd be surprised at how, how much is actually happening and how much activity. And I, like you think, what the fuck are they looking for? I mean, like, I, that's what I said to him. And he then went and through and explained, well, you know, if you got to this point in Australia... And then you could set up, then you could fly in and technically set up your own your own army that could then start to then fight and move further forward. Because the biggest advantage of Australia is it's a Very long knowledge. way to go, right? Mm. And if you really want to come here, you have to be. So then you talk about, okay, they start controlling the minds of certain things that you'd like to mine and that could be very valuable. And, and like, it puts it into perspective because it does make you think, but... It, but it also makes you think, geez, we're wasting a lot of fucking money on defence. So, there's a, you know, I I think about this a bit. I often reflect that, you know, up until the last year and a half, I probably never thought about sovereign security and other aspects. Yeah. Um, and I think there's probably more uneasiness in the world at the moment about security than there has been for a long time. And, you know, I think that it is a shame that there's not a more peaceful view around everybody but you know different people think differently and you know people's way of lives is important to them and you know people want to protect their ways of life um, whether it's our way of life or someone else's way of life people want their way of life to persist and that means that people take the view that others might take away their way of life and therefore we need to have capability to deter them from doing that which means you start building defense capability on the plus side defense capability has given you know, birth to so much that we love, right? Yeah. Like, you know. Well, the like, internet. The internet, TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> Just TikTok is a data sucking machine to get your biometric information. <laughs> it is. It is. Yeah. But. So are those other apps, you know, those apps where you like take a photo of your face and it augments it and makes yeah, it look weird? Just data sucking. Yeah. And I, I think for me, uh, you look at things that you know the social dilemma, like where people it sort of it, it sort of it, it goes to show, hey, you know, guys, I think people like I understand if like the the comment from that movie that if you're not paying for the you are the product, yeah, if you, that comment there is the best comment ever because it's true. It is so accurate, and I think you know, go back, like some people think about stuff like this and others don't. Like this is just my observation of the world. I am deeply curious and always questioning why, right? Like I'm passionate about the impact of digital technologies on young people's brains because yep. I think that we're wandering blindly into a world where supercomputers are manipulating our neurons as a result of spending too much time looking at screens. And I think it's very, very damaging. I just, it, it amazes me how I don't think a lot of people are really thinking about it. Like in my world, I talk to a lot of people I, about this and I don't think people want to think about it. It's crazy. Mm. And I, I look at, I love talking about Nat on these because she doesn't, she doesn't listen. <laughs> <laughs> but like we can't watch a movie. Cinema's different, but we can't technically watch a series or a movie on the couch without her. The other day she checked her phone 40 times in less than, it, was, it, it probably wasn't even an hour, right? I was just sort of going. And. And then she asked me, oh, what, what, what did I just miss? And I'm like, fuck, babe, I am not going to fucking explain. I, I, can, I can go home and I can turn off. So I can put it aside and just I don't like looking at things after 9 o'clock because it might invoke some emotion where I have to – it might, might make it a bit more unsettling for me to sleep. So I see what, what the kids do and then I look at – other friends and and what they do, just give them the device. And I'm like, man, it, it's really setting them up to be, this is your new dummy. And just 
keep out of us, leave us alone. And I think that's a bit of a selfish thing. So I, I was having this conversation <laughs> with someone the other day on a school, on a, on a governing council of a school. We are talking about um, sort of the kids and technology and one of the, the astute parents made the observation that it's actually the adults who are more addicted to technology than the children because it helps them have a much easier parenting experience. Oh, here you go. Here's your dummy. Here's your, your digital pacifier. Yeah. And that digital pacifier works right up until they're quite old. Yeah. <laughs> I like the old school pacifier. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and, and which will soon be legal here. But if when you look at that, like, does it, it might, but I, I'm, I'm, I think I'm a, I'm a bit a deep thinker. I'm not, you know, there's certain things that I like, and I look at just what's going to happen. That movie, the, the, albeit maybe a slightly biased, it was was very direct in saying, hey, the, the brain power behind this screen, which just you don't think of it as much, and, you know, your kids aren't thinking there's a human computers behind there, is frightening. So when I was a little kid, I was playing like a donkey Game Kong, watch. Nintendo Game watch, donkey, mate. yeah, like this. And I was having a chat with a parent the other day and they were like, Game I know, Boy. but it's it's just like a Game Boy. And I'm like, yeah, nah, it's mm. not a supercomputer <laughs> with algorithms designed to addict your kid's attention. But hey, whatever. <laughs> if you if it makes you feel better that it's just like an old Nintendo, that's fine. Yeah. But it's not. It's like a supercomputer with walls of engineers working out how to addict your attention because you're the product. Your attention is what they sell. Where do you think it's going to go? It's a good question. I think about it a lot. Um my view is that in the end that regulations will have to be inserted, like like government will have to step in with regulation to do something about the digital addiction challenges. Because I mean, the government can be trusted with holding all that information. Well, I don't think the government's going to hold it, but it's like the government stepped in with regulation about other types of media, like the government regulated newspapers, the government regulated TVs. Porn. Um, well, you know, porn was a lot more complicated before there was digital devices. <laughs> yeah, I know. You used to have to get DVD. <laughs> VHS. Beta. What, magazine? Do you think it was called Mag Beta? Magazine. <laughs> you think it was called Beta for a reason? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. But, it, you know, it's changed very quickly. And you're right. I, I got Game Boy. I got new Game Boy backlit. So they put a backlight on the colour Game Boy. It's so it's amazing. Like I was like, wow, where was this when I was a kid? Remember you had the magnifying glass on there and you couldn't see? Still have that problem now. The eyes aren't as good. But, yeah, it, it's going to be an interesting one because there's there's certain things I think you can and can't regulate. And I think people are becoming, you know, it's almost like a buyer beware or you use that. It's It feels like that's what it is now. And I can't see turning around to Facebook and going, Oh, you know, they, you know, no one's talked about Facebook's latest data breach of, you know, 400 million accounts or something like that. It, oh, that's probably not enough, but it was a lot. No one really talks about the privacy of where your information goes. Do you think it'll get to a stage where you like a, a lot of, I've seen a few tech companies now saying, hey, I'm happy to sell. So for me, McDonald's, like, it's not that I love your product or that, but I love what you do as a business because it's quite clever and adapting and changing along the way. So I'm happy to give McDonald's whatever data they want about me that's on my Google search. But then I go to someone that I don't like, um, like B BMW. Well, I don't want to hear about a BMW because uh, for me it's not that, that brand that I associate with. So... Do you think it'll get to a stage where I tick the box of, okay, I'm happy to give all my data stance socks, you know, Red Bull, Jamu, like, you know, tick, 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 and then I should get paid a bit for being the but, advocate for that? I mean, there's a few sort of trends in that direction and people starting to talk more about data sovereignty and like sort of you being the in charge of your own data. Uh, there's huge forces against that, right? Like, you know, there are trillions of dollars worth of shareholder value tied up in companies that exploit your data for profit. Yeah. So, you know, I, I sort of, I'm, a, I'm an optimist. I'm yeah. always an optimist. Yeah. So my view is that, yes, I, I'm optimistic people will wake up and start to, you know, vote with their feet and they'll start to change their behaviour and adopt things that are more respectful of private information. That's my optimistic view. I don't believe it. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm with you. I can, you know, it's like we we're talking. Sometimes about people have said I'm blindly optimistic <laughs> or completely over the top optimistic. But <laughs> so, so yeah, I, I think it's going to be a very interesting moving forward. Uh, and 
even what we want to do the Drake's app, like we're sitting there talking about things that, oh, you know, yeah, we we are looking at, hey, we want to use that data to better experience your life and uh, in our stores because of what you buy and things like that. And then I know, you know, one day someone comes and says, oh, you know, all those customers that are buying, you know, the kitty cat, whatever, do you want to, we, you know, we can pay you this amount of money if you, you know, I can see that's what happens, right? And that's what for people so they can understand. Someone will come in and say, here's a big amount of cash. We want to know all about that customer data. And for us as a business, we want to make sure that that's not the sellout because it, for us, it's not about making money on that data. It's about giving the experience to the customer. And I think that's the difference. And I think that's what I, my view is that that what, is what will win in the end, right? Like I think that there will be trusted relationships people have yep. with companies and organisations that they want to do business with. Yep. And over time, it'll be like if you build that trust and like, yeah, Drake's take all my data. Yeah. You make my shopping experience so much easier and I value how much time you save for me. And as a result of that, I'm happy for you to have my data as long as you don't share it with anyone, you bastard. <laughs> you know, and yeah. that's the, the, you know, it's hard to build that trust. It's easy to lose it. So I think, you know, the moment you do do something that feels creepy to the consumer or, you know, breaches the reason they gave you that data, then you get in trouble. So I'm guessing you read the terms and conditions of things. Most of them. Have you ever read the Qantas Wi-Fi? Like, no, well, I'd I haven't you, read that one. Well, is it frightening? A, it's, <laughs> it is frightening. <laughs> really? Like it talks about we have a six-month period where we can give all of that data to a third party to basically do what they want. It actually has it in there. And I was like, Never doing this. Never now. No. Oh, I need the internet. Now I'm done. <laughs> I now, need the internet. Now I'm done. I, I fought it off. I told everyone about it. And then now I get on the plane, automatically hooks up to my phone. We're fucking suckers. Yeah, we're suckers for easy. Fuck. Yeah. You make someone's life easy, you can almost do what you want. Mm -hmm. And it's I, I don't see I I can't see that changing. I, I can I and there's so much money. I mean, you know, good, Apple's pretty good at the privacy. And if you compare Apple and Samsung, they are streaks ahead. You know, and Apple's, I think, an inherently decent actor with this stuff. They're not exploiting it with other people. They literally are using it to make your experience better. Yeah. And when you do sign up to the apps and that, they're trying to have some rules and what, like, but, yeah, they're way ahead. In that regard, but you know, you, you, where's the big money being made? Google, you know, all these companies exploiting that. And there, there's another good doc I'm trying to think of where they, ah, oh, basically how they they were the ones exploiting the info because they bought old data that they forgot to delete. Ah, oh, it'll, it'll come to me. Ah, oh, I've done a I've done a review on it. Oh, Cambridge. Cambridge. Yeah. Cambridge Analytica. Yeah. Yeah. That to me was like, oh, wow. wow. Actually, they all knew about this. This wasn't like people didn't know that we're using that data and we just happened to be deleted, but it wasn't. Um, <laughs> it's it's that, a pretty murky world, man. Like I'm still optimistic, man. I reckon <laughs> I'm still optimistic. I'm an optimist. I think things will emerge where people make it really easy to not have to do that. Like I think that, you know, the forces change around these things over time. Because, I mean, if you have a process that if I got paid like something, like five bucks, ten bucks, whatever, for giving my information to the ones I liked and if I wanted to give it to more to get some more money. No, but if you got 500 bucks a year by doing that, would it really change? Like this is the problem. It's like the amounts of money you, you the individual, get is nowhere near as much as the aggregated information is worth to the people that exploit it. Yeah, okay, that amount wouldn't, but Bezos has got a bit of money. Sergey, Sergey, they got a bit of money. Like these, these guys wouldn't miss like a few hundred million dollars. Well, so here's here's something that I think you'll start to see is you'll start to see the really big billionaires. Right, I think you know Twiggy Forrest's an interesting example of it with Vindaroo Foundation. People with real money starting to tackle big problems without the constraints that government of politics government. provide. So you know, I reckon you start to see more and more sort of good billionaires putting their money behind trying to change really problematic issues. And that's going to be a, a great thing to see. And mm. I think the gates, um, well, is probably dividing it all by now. 
Um, but, he's, yeah, he's, made about, he's made a lot of money out of vaccines, hasn't he? <laughs> <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> Oh, mate. Oh, oh, Have I'm, I just opened the door? No, nah, George, I, don't get me started. Because I, I, um, I, don't, I don't know. I, I'm fearful of rules coming into place where people make you do something to, to do something that of free will. And, and I, look at, I look at Podcast 25. We had um, Antonio the Spartan. He's a he's a MMA guy and he's got a he's got a one championship contract and he's training one of the best gyms in Miami. It'll come to me what it is. And they said, you know, to go to America, you've got to be vaccinated. You have to be vaccinated, blah, 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 blah. He lands over to in America, non-vaccinated. He, you know, his vaccination, he points at healthy food. Don't, like, I post something of food. He goes, oh, I don't see the vegetables. Like he's one of these guys that comment. Oh, sorry. And he goes, my vaccination's me being healthy and looking after myself. And, you know, you call it optimistic. But you, the media has made you believe that, no, uh, you can't go anywhere without being vaccinated. And I, I think it's a scary place when you start to get forced to do something. What's your Yeah, I think that it's an interesting lens, right? There's very a lot of examples where you're forced to do things in, in how the structure of society works. Um, you know, I think it is dangerous when you start to force people to, to get a vaccine for this purpose. But, you know, so that being said, you're forced to – well, not forced, but – you can only get the childcare subsidy at your daycare if your kids have had their vaccinations, which includes the measles, mumps, rubella vaccinations. And, you know, some of the vaccinations that babies have when they're young are sort of forced in some respects. Yeah, 100%. Uh, so it's, it's a real, I don't, to be honest with you, I don't think I understand the problem well enough to be able to have a, a well refined view on it. But I do agree that it is dangerous. It's a dangerous line when you start going to have these freedoms, you must do X. Yeah. Um, I think that is a, you know, it's a dangerous place to be. It, it it should be up to the um, the individual, but I also understand the other side of the fence is oh well, if I choose to go somewhere and I come back <clears throat> and I'm infected with something, I mean fucking what are we up to? I don't know how many different strains I've heard in the last yeah Delta COVID, Delta Delta Plus um, Alpha Rambo whatever <laughs> like all of these different <laughs> ones that I've heard like of course they're finding more because. They're looking for more. Like, you know, the flu's way down because they're, it's maybe and people aren't washing hands. But to me, I think it's an interesting area. Uh, yeah, I think it's a very interesting area to look at. And when I look at it, people go, oh, you're an anti-vaxxer. I'm, I'm fucking not, but I've never had a flu shot. I've, like, I, I got vaccinated as a kid because I didn't have a say in it. But I think... Once you get to a decision where you're an adult, you should be able to choose what you put in your body, especially a vaccine with fucking God knows what nanotechnology. <laughs> well, I mean, I've had the Pfizer and I've been dreaming of Bill Gates a lot. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Like. So that's, that's actually not true, but it's bloody funny. <laughs> I was like, like before he was separated on the boat with girls or with his wife. <laughs> Just <laughs> oh, uh, damn, that is so funny. I like it. So you you talk about. I think I got tears from Molly. <laughs> it's a fucking good one. He's going to use that one with his mates. Yeah, yeah, I got that fire. <laughs> It'll be the next hero. So, uh, yeah. So let's um move on. It, it's an interesting COVID world because. It does change things. Um, where do you think this will be ongoing? Oh, look. <laughs> well, you're going to space, so does it fucking matter? Well, well, fuck this. We'll go. We'll get out <laughs> of here. We're already sending machines up there. Oh, look, I, look the, there is a reasonable chance, in my view, based on the little reading I've done, and I'm no epidemiologist or anything, but you know, this virus becoming endemic instead of pandemic, and endemic means it's like the flu, it's just part yeah. of yep. circulates around, is reasonably probable yeah so you know learning to live with it is going to be something that probably has to happen yeah um and you know you're starting to see countries like singapore that are just going on well, okay. we might as well just start living with it yeah. like, and work out how to live with it and you know i think that that's probably going to be where we end up which is you know i think a lot of people are really fearful of it I, i'm fearful of the fortress australia impact like you know we've had a pretty good experience in some respects you're a bit of a germaphobe too i am not mate i'm not a germaphobe 
But I think Fortress Australia is, a, is an interesting concept. For, what, well, mean? it's just like the borders are up. You, you know, you, it's hard to get out. It's hard to get back. Borders so, slam shut. Uh, yeah. There's no yeah. gate. <laughs> <laughs> um, just, <laughs> but yeah, it's. Just I think saying. for a lot of people that want to travel for family reasons, yeah, love one, like it's a, like it's emotionally difficult, psychologically painful it's to not have that freedom. It's probably saving me a fucking lot of money at the moment. Like that's the why wife, everyone's spending it on property and the, wine. Well, the wife's not booking stuff in. Ah, uh, yeah, the wife's not booking it in. Like, and it's it's, you know what? Yeah, I, you're right. I, I, I did exactly that. Yeah, I fucking spent it. Yeah, fuck. <laughs> What was I thinking? <laughs> uh, I had this glimmer of hope, but hopefully it goes a bit longer and then <laughs> save some more money. Look, yeah, but you spent it anyway. Correct. Babe's not listening anyway, so. <laughs> um, <clears throat> okay, so we go in, we've talked a little bit about space and I think it's been very interesting of recent, the amount of UFO sightings Ooh. that there has been. And they don't call them UFOs anymore. They call them... Something else, UTOs, yeah, ultra terrestrial. Uh, I, don't I, don't, I think it's a UTO. So, can someone like that? So, they call them not UFOs. So, hence why it's sort of escaped a bit. Pentagon's now released pretty good footage of things that, that they are unable to say. Now, someone once, I once said, I, I once heard someone say that once you start looking for things to fight in space, another budget comes along of, of huge amounts of money. <laughs> and I'm like, wow, we're in the middle of this pandemic and now we're starting to, like, during, during this, the, they, they had these new laws put in place which meant that the Pentagon actually had to release footage after a period of time, which has never happened before. Which makes me wonder how that fucking got through. That was when uh, probably Trump was in charge. So, yeah, UAPs. UAPs. Yeah. Which stands for uh, Unexplained Aerial Phenomena. <laughs> Is that the new UFO? Yeah. Is it so UAP? So that's how it sort of skipped through the... So what do you reckon? Do you reckon they're aliens? Yeah. yeah. Uh, that's a good question. I, I think there's something out there and I think they're... The ability for vehicles to travel in a way we can't can because you're pretty out there. Like they talk about how these things suck the gravity through, or I, I don't know. Like, but is there little people walking around using their minds to communicate? They don't bother. They don't have genitals because they just fucking think about it, and that happens. <laughs> like you know, they. <laughs> this is. <laughs> This is this is what they say about these yeah. ones. I, I mean, I have. Are they the greys or the reptilians? Oh, uh, okay, so that's <laughs> going deep into it. But to me, I, I think we'd be foolish to think this tiny little <clears throat> planet. But I, 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 I've got something when I was younger that I saw, and these guys are probably they're going to roll their eyes. Oh, we haven't got funny. that long to go. But I saw something. We're going to get out of here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I saw something that. As a kid, I look back now and it's far more like what happened, but have I talked myself into it? Have you created that story in yep. your own head? No, no, have definitely. You so, embellished it. No, no, there, there's auntie, uncle. We definitely saw something on the York Peninsula. It was Corny Point. And it came in and out, moved around, sat there and at rapid pace and sat there for a while. It wasn't, wasn't like it was like, yeah, there no noise at all. I don't know. If, but. But at the time, I was like, oh, yeah, but I didn't think much of it. And now I look back and I think, oh, that's unexplained. So my view, I, I sort of, I'm with you. I think that it's unlikely that there are not, given the just vastness of what we live in. Yeah. And if they've been a civilization for tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of years longer than us, how did, like, who knows what they've worked out? Like, look, look at what we've worked out in the last couple of hundred years as a species. Who knows what they've worked out? So it's like, you can't, like, I will believe that they exist until someone proves that they don't in my mind. So have you seen all the latest footage? No. Moral of, moral of this is I think it's very unusual this information has been released when it did. So why Which, did they do it in the middle of a pandemic? Yeah, in, What's it, the it was actually the first slot from the Pentagon came out in June last year, which COVID was March, April, and then June it came out 
There's something that's happened during COVID. That's what it is. So yeah. let's, let's, you know. So when you watch it, you think, well, why is it released then? And that's the footage that that you see. Like it's traveling at something like they can't even explain it. Like it's like, and that, that for, for instance, that have you heard that Captain Favor? No, I haven't heard it. When you, how he, do you find all the time to watch this? Oh, stuff? that's a Joe Rogan, but he, right. he does a podcast with Lex Friedman, and that guy. Uh, it's fun listening to really intelligent people. <laughs> I'm like, oh, yeah. So I get into listening to him and he breaks it down into, and this favour, guys, he's seeing this thing and then it, it's dropped into the water. They've gone over the water and that's what's freaking them out because that new term is come because, well, fuck, hang on, these things are going into the water. Yeah. How the hell are they doing that? In and out? Yeah. Really no, fast? No, they don't see in and out. Uh, maybe they're from the centre of the earth. Oh, George. <laughs> <laughs> But do you think they come over and go to Earth and go, fuck, what the fuck are these What's people? going on here? These guys are crazy. <laughs> They're all walking around looking at these tiny screens uh, all day. Uh, it's, fuck, it's come a long way from E.T. <laughs> uh, did you watch E.T. as a kid? I did. I did. You know, I was never really that, you know, space was never something that I thought I'd ever be involved in as a kid. But um, it's inspired me now. I, 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 I look at things from when I was younger and I've, I've got – I've been into this thing about going back to watch, like I've gone back and watched ET, gone uh, back and watched Jaws. Like I've been going back and Goonies. And, and I I've watched been, Goonies with my kids the other day. It's uh, so it's, good. It's so good. Like, and I was thinking, our kids, are, you can't tell when something's real or not anymore. And that's great. In some ways. Yeah. We haven't got into fake news and, you know, deep fake. Oh, wow. We we're going to run out of time, George. You're, you're I'm happy to talk, but you're... you're <laughs> no, but I do have to go. So, but oh, there is one thing we haven't talked about, JP. We haven't talked... No. Yep, yep. We, can, I, can I steal the mic for a second and just plug unashamedly something that I'm involved yeah, 100%. in? 100%. So, you know, I, I may have talked to you briefly about it before, but so we are, through Space Machines Company, involved in a mission to the moon. Oh, so Lunar Ascent. Lunar Ascent. Yeah, yeah Lunar Ascent. Australia's yeah. mission to the moon. So, you know, I just would love to share with the, the audience our, our aspiration for that. And, you know, we are aiming through the Lunar Ascent Initiative, which has been set up as a not-for-profit um, yep. to raise funds from large corporates and philanthropists to fund sending some Australian satellites to lunar orbit uh, in 2024 and 2025 or thereabouts. We haven't worked out the exact timing. Um, and the outcome of that mission is we want to inspire all Australians to value and pay attention to space and use that money to pay Australian space companies like Fleet and ourselves and others, yep. you know, Miriota, Innovore, to actually be able to get capabilities that are proven to work to get things to the moon and help grow the Australian space ecosystem. But most importantly, we are also <coughs> working with the Indigenous community. Um, you know, as the, the custodians of land and sea for 60,000 years, we think they need to have a proactive and appropriate role in custodianship over what Earth is doing in space, and we think that's a great role for Australia to play. So, um, so it's a very aspirational project. You know, a lot more is going to be coming out about it soon. But, you know, listeners, keep an eye out for Lunar Ascent. The Lunar Ascent initiative is going to start to we get can more put the, uh, We can put something. We've got, I've actually got it here, actually, funny enough. So we can put that in the link below. Lunar Ascent. So Lunar we, Ascent. Ascent. Well, you don't yep. want Ascent. That means you're coming down. <laughs> yeah. Ascent up, yeah. Lunar Ascent. <laughs> yeah. So you. So that means you're trying to – so when that's not far away, 2024? 2024, we'll do uh, one – yes, it's coming pretty quickly. So, you know, we, we aim – if everything works perfectly, we'd love to launch an Australian-made rocket from an Australian launch site with an Australian orbital transfer vehicle with Australian-made satellites with Australian technologies and Australian communications and do as much of that mission uh, as an Australian mission as possible. That's amazing. And – it's to inspire, like the two kids that are at school now, to yes. maybe want to go into that Correct. area. Correct. Yeah, and it, to value, understand how important space is to the future of Australia. You know, to understand why we're investing in space, to sort of be inspired to go and try difficult projects themselves, and you know, have aspirational objectives. So I look at now. My, one of my girls is off to code camp today, yep. and for the next three days. Funny enough. And the little, well, that, she's a seven-year-old. And then uh, that six-year-old was spewing because she, she has to go to a different one. <laughs> yeah, to separate the ages. Yeah, like it's only a year, but I want to go with my older sister. <clears throat> so if you look at the what's the trend, like, you do kids now go to school? Like, I remember I want to be an astronaut. You probably thought it fleetingly. 
Do kids, are they getting better technology through school to say, hey, you can be an astronaut? Does it matter if you're male or female or trans or neutral or whatever? I just think the more content there is about the art of the possible and what's happening that they're exposed to, the better, right? Like you know, think about how much sport our kids see just day to day. If they see more content like video and like they just see more happening around space and lots of different variations of that, people going to space, robots going to space, like Australians doing more, the more they can go, actually, I could be like that or I could have a role to play in that, the more people will be inspired and be involved in it, I think. So I think, I think a lot of it's just about inspiration and accessibility, like, oh, wow, that's inspiring. Oh, and I believe I could be involved. It's like watching the rover, which... You know, it's walking, not crawling around a lot. They, they've got a drone in <laughs> flying around on Mars. Flying mm. around, is that that Mars? Is it? Yeah. So the the drone, the Americans landed Perseverance rover, and then there's a flying drone that sort of sits on top of the the rover. That you know, first flight on Mars, which is pretty incredible. Yeah. See that that's incredible, and it's happening so fast. It's amazing you're at the forefront of it. I I actually haven't asked you. The real hard hitting questions, yeah. All oh, right, really? We're running out of time, mate. I'm going to no. get out of here before I get the hard ones. No, no. So, if you, these are it, because we've unfortunately have got to hurry. If you weren't doing what you're doing now and money was not, uh, yeah, it didn't matter, what would you be doing? I reckon I would put my time and energy into the pursuit of the impact of digital technologies on kids. And I reckon that's a problem that needs to be solved. And there's enough people solving climate change. <laughs> I really want to, I really want to, I would literally be just spend my time and effort trying to ensure that we understand the impact of digital technologies on our young and do something to get that organised in the right way. Oh, it's a, that's a whole podcast in itself. <clears throat> what do you wish you'd known when you first started out? Like if you could look to a... George, Freeney, like all my, they're older than your kids, but what worldly advice would you give to people wanting to start in the space industry? Just be curious, believe that you've got the capability to learn how to do things and talk, talk to people a lot and just be really honest in striving for what you want. Like you only get places by asking people for help and being really honest about that. So it's like, don't be afraid to like call someone up and ask them to be involved. Like if some, if a school kid called me and said, oh my God, you know, I just want to have a chat with you about space. I'm like, okay, let's go, let's do that. So it's like, be really honest about asking for help because people love it when they get asked for help by people who are interested and enthusiastic and passionate. So true, great advice there. If there was one thing Oh, you've almost answered. If there was one thing that you could do that would have an impact on the world, what would it be? Uh, some, you know, it could be personal. You've you've sort of mentioned that you'd be working on like what happens behind the screens or digital. That's an interesting question. You know, I think if, I think it would be right now in relation to digital technology and like the impact of it and why why our brains sort of, you know, it would be digital technology. Yeah, I, I got a hunch that's exactly yeah. what you would say. Yeah. Now, unfortunately, George, this is the most hard-hitting question that we have. This is the last question, so, you know, put the tissues away. This is, this is it. If you died and came back as a board game, what board game would best describe your life? <laughs> that is not a question I was expecting. <laughs> what board game would best? Now, why you think of it? Um, I'm looking behind you there. I, and I want to, yeah, I've had Snakes and Ladders. Uh, uh, Darren Thomas, I think, was yeah, snakes, snakes and Ladders. And I've had, uh, that was Aaron there. That's Yahtzee. <laughs> Um, I, I went with, um, I think Scrabble for me sometimes like, and the reason behind it was sometimes, like I say, really good stuff and some not so good. So sometimes it's worth a lot and sometimes it's Oh, you know, Matt, I, I've got an idea here. I'm going to go with the game of life. Okay. Now we have had game of life, huh? Um, now why, why, why did you pick that game? 
Well, I think it sort of captures some of the the nuance of rolling through life, right? Um, and I have fond memories of that as a kid. Game of life, it is. There you have it. So I'm happy for that. Oh, well, I mean, we just touched the surface. It goes pretty quick, huh? I can't believe it's been almost two hours, man. That's, yeah. in, that's uh, incredible. It's I, been a good chat. Uh, it's been a great chat. No spliffs were smoked in the process, so you can't, <laughs> you can't, yeah, you, you, know, you can't do be the next Elon Musk, no. which I, I, I bloody hope you are. Um, uh, I do wish you well on all your endeavours. Um, you know, we're closely watching what you're doing with space machines and the excitement behind that is not only for what you're doing there, but the difference that you're making for South Australia and you, you're, you have an impact on that and sending stuff into space, it's pretty cool. Thanks, mate. I've really enjoyed the chat and it's, a, it's an honour and privilege to be working on those projects and have been on the show. Sweet. Cheers, Thank mate. you. Ciao. Bye.